Chapter 3.10 Domestication is dangerous. You ever plow a field, Summer? To plant the kiwa or sorghum, or whatever the hell it is you eat? You kill everything on the ground and under it. You kill every snake, every frog, every mouse, mole, bull, worm, quail. You kill them all. So I guess the only real question is, how cute does an animal have to be before you care if it dies to feed you? John Dutton, Yellowstone, Reference 64. Chapter 3.10.1. Disclaimer number one. This subject hits close to home. This section lays the conceptual bedrock for understanding complex social behavior in pack animals, how they establish dominance hierarchies, settle intraspecies disputes, establish control authority over limited resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property. A few disclaimers before entering a discussion about animal pack behavior dominance hierarchies and the strategic implications of different pecking order heuristics. Sapiens are pack animals, and like many other packs, the most brutal and painful struggles between sapiens are centered around the establishment of pecking order. The following chapter has a more thorough discussion about the power projection tactics that sapiens use to establish pecking order, but it's helpful to acknowledge the sensitivities in this section up front so we understand how emotionally charged this topic can be. Our emotions, our ideologies will most likely affect how we react to conversations about pecking order strategies. In the author's experience doing research for this grounded theory, the topic of pecking order often made people feel uncomfortable or upset, likely because of how closely these concepts are linked to our own personal experiences. This part of the conversation simply hits close to home. For the sake of formulating a cohesive and conceptually insightful argument about the complex emergent behavior of new power projection technologies, the reader is asked to indulge the author temporarily and to stay cognizant of the broader context of what they're reading. This is a thesis about Bitcoin, a technology that strikes directly at the heart of topics like power projection and resource control. Pecking order is just another name for a resource control protocol, and it would be useful to develop a conceptually dense understanding of naturally occurring resource control protocols before entering into a discussion about Bitcoin. What follows does not reflect the author's personal ideology about what resource control protocols should or shouldn't be used within human organizations. This is a logical discussion about mutually observable behavior in nature, designed to help the reader draw out insights that help us better understand the emergent behavior of Bitcoin. What follows is uncomfortable to talk about, but critically important to understand. Chapter 3.10.2. Disclaimer number two. Don't forget about survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is a logical error which causes people to be susceptible to making incorrect conclusions because they discount information they can't see because it didn't survive some selection process. Survivorship bias can affect a discussion about peck and order heuristics by causing people to discount heuristics they can't see merely because it didn't survive the natural selection process. On the flip side, survivorship bias can also make people prone to discounting information they can see because they lose sight of the fact that the reason why they see what they see is because they because what they see is what survives. Survivorship bias is why the author has remain, reminded the reader multiple times that what we see in nature today is incontrovertibly proven to survive nature. This is a phenomenon we can use to our advantage when it comes to gaining insights about different heuristics related to survival. If you want to know what pecking order heuristics are best for survival, 
simply observe nature. Nature has spent the past 4 billion years separating the weak the wheat from the chaff and has already figured out the difference between heuristics that survive and heuristics that don't. This is something to keep at the forefront of our minds throughout the remainder of this thesis. Survivorship bias is important to understand when talking about peck and order heuristics employed by different pack animals. There is a wide range of different peck and order heuristics available to wild animals. For example, finders keepers, or first come first served, are popular peck and order heuristics used by sapiens. Hence why sapiens stand in line so often, a uniquely human behavior that we all hate, right? Family first, oldest first, and youngest first are other popular peck and order heuristics. For peck and order heuristics, which don't involve high levels of intelligence, intentionally, intentionality, or theory of mind, it's very likely that over the past several hundred million years, Animal packs of all shapes and sizes operating in all types of environments have experimented with practically all of them. There is extremely low probability that we can come up with a non-abstract peck and order heuristic which hasn't been tried many times before over the past several hundred million years by innumerable animal packs whose survivorship depended on finding them the most strategically optimal peck and order heuristic. Therefore, if we have a good idea for peck and order heuristic that we don't see in nature, it's most likely not because that heuristic hasn't been tried, it's more likely because that heuristic is dem dem demonstrably incapable of surviving. Therefore, we don't see it in the wild. Chapter 3.10.3. Disclaimer number three. Remember that nature is a sociopath. Look at the eyes of that jaguar. Nature as created in those kind of eyes, the perfect vision of terror. If you looked into those eyes, there's no forgiveness. There's no emotions. There's just ferocity and aggression and death. Joe Rogan, reference 65. Good job. Appreciating nature requires recognizing upfront that most organisms are sociopaths. Nature has no apparent capacity to see, understand, or care about sapient theology, philosophy, or ideology. Moral good is a highly subjective and abstract construct which exists in an ontologically different category than the study of nature. This is further explained in the following chapter. Therefore, to better understand nature, it's useful to ignore human belief systems about right or wrong, fair or unfair, moral or immoral. These topics are almost irrelevant to the subject of natural selection and survival. Things which sapiens consider to be theologically, philosophically, or ideologically repugnant and reprehensible are often routine in nature. For example, suicide, murder, and cannibalism are so common in nature that they're often considered to be unremarkable behavior. Not the case for us. Aging, for example, is an involved form of suicide. Cells appear to have learned the habit of deliberately destroying themselves after a select duration of time as an evolved evolution tactic. Aging, for example, is an evolved form of suicide. Cells appear to have learned the habit of deliberately destroying themselves after a select duration of time as an evolution tactic. Why would nature do something so inefficient and wasteful? Because the world is filled with predators and entropy, which means the environment 
is constantly changing. Organisms with long lives can't change their genetic features as quickly as organisms with short lives, and therefore less adaptable to their environment, thus less likely to survive. DNA is the passing down of data, of information. Remember that through this as well. Aging is a way for organisms to counteract the strategic problem. It is a highly effective way to get a species to become more adaptable by forcing them to cycle through more evolutionary genetic features faster and test them faster in a live production environment. Shorter lifespans mean shorter mean time to deploy new genetic features that will help the species discover what it needs to prosper. The lifespans we see in different species today represent the optimal mean time to deployment speed of new genetic features for that given species. For sapiens, it's around 70 years. Life also has no problem killing itself with genetic malfunctions caused by its evolutionary prototype and strategy. Nature doesn't have a pre-production environment or a test net to work out its bugs. It deploys new features directly into live production environment and simply accepts the consequences. An organism with a crippling genetic mutation is a prototype for the future version of that species that clearly doesn't function properly in an operational environment. Combined with aging, these malfunctions enable life to fail fast, fail often, and fail forward. The downside of this process is crippling genetic malfunctions at the individual organism level. The side is the long term, the upside is the long term survival of the species as the species remains adaptable to a changing environment. This process is how life gets to endothermy in time to build a suite of self heating organisms which can survive a me meteoric winter. As we have already established, killing is routine in nature for many of these same reasons. Life appears to take advantage of predation as an external motivator to accelerate the pace of innovation. Weed out the weak and unadaptable and revector resources to the more qualified survivors. We tend to want to overlook these uncomfortable parts of nature. We don't upvote these moments to the top of our social media feeds. Instead, at the top of our social media feeds, we get cute, adorable moments. We watch documentaries with carefully selected depictions of nature designed to thrill or inspire us. The epic music plays in the background and the distinguished voice with an English accent makes an insightful remark. From our high tower of prosperity, this false depiction of nature becomes a generation's primary source of information about the real world, and it creates a beauty complex. We only see a carefully edited and thematically airbrushed version of nature, or corporately censored version, designed to keep our attention. Missing from the top of our social media feeds is the scene where the mother squirrel <clears throat> excuse me, eats her own babies alive to make it through January. Disney skipped over the part where Mufasa murdered every cub in the pride and then raped their mothers after killing the previous lion. That part doesn't fit the inspiring storyline they're trying to feed to their audience. So they just skip over that part and start with the birth of Simba then somehow we're just supposed to accept the fact that the animals which have been hunted by lions their entire life are inclined to celebrate the birth of yet another lion. The truth is that nature is not nearly as pleasant as what we see on our TV screens. Survival is an ugly business. It always has been, and it probably always will be. This ugly part of nature is less entertaining or inspiring to us, so we don't see it as often. The unfortunate side effect of this behavior at scale is that it distorts our perception of reality, and it inhibits us from understanding primordial economic dynamics. The survivor's dilemma and the existential importance of physical power projection. 
for the sake of gaining deeper insight into the potential socio-technical impact of new technologies like Bitcoin, the reader is invited to recalibrate their understanding of nature. This means allowing ourselves to feel uncomfortable for a short period of time so we can better understand the dynamics of physical power projection and how it relates to security and survivorship. There's a very clear but ideologically repugnant reason why lions kill their own cubs. Nature has given us a lesson about survival, and it could be beneficial for us to pay attention if we want to survive against our predators too. Chapter 3.10.4 Correlation doesn't imply causation, but randomized A-B experimentation does. It is possible to prove that changing a human population's pecking order strategy, how they choose who to feed and breed, to reward different behavior than strength and aggression, is systematically hazardous. However, that would require the design of a series of very large, very long, and probably unethical experiments. Fortunately, we don't need to do perform these experiments. We don't need to perform these experiments because we have already done them on other animals for tens of thousands of years. The domestication of animals is incontrovertible proof that changing an animal's pack, an animal pack's pecking order strategy to reward different behavior than strength and aggression is systematically hazardous to them. Discovering the root causes of social phenomenon is difficult. It requires rigorous measurement and design of randomized experiments to control observable and unobservable factors while simultaneously isolating the relationships we want to examine. Randomized experimentation is critical for ensuring that observable and unobservable factors outside of the relationships we want to examine don't account for the differences in emergent behavior. With enough randomized experiment Experimentational data, it is possible to analyze the true casual causal effect of changing specific variables between a treatment and control group. In other words, it's possible to determine with high confidence that factor Y causes affect Z rather than merely correlates to it. With the ability to gain causal inference via randomized experimentation in mind, consider animal dominance hierarchies and what effect pecking order has on an animal pack security and prosperity. If one were to ask the question, how would a different pecking order heuristic where pack animals don't reward their most physically powerful and aggressive members with feeding and breeding rights, change an animal pack's capacity to survive and prosper in the wild. One would have to find a way to generate enough randomized experimentation, no, experimentation data to casually infer a relationship between these two variables. It is simply not possible to determine causal relationships between a species pecking order strategy and capacity for survival without randomized experiments. If scientists wanted to investigate whether making a group of animals less inclined to impose severe physical costs on neighboring animals has a direct impact on their safety, security, and survival, they would have to run randomized experiments on dozens of different pack animal species where they control for the same variable each time. They would need to find a way to infer with an a interfere with an animal population's pecking order instincts to prevent them from feeding and breeding their most physically powerful and aggressive members. The then they would need to measure changes in emergent behavior by comparing each population to a control group of animals which didn't have their pecking order altered. If you don't see where he's going with this at this point, like uh, maybe this book isn't for you, but it rhymes with log.
This experiment would have both practical and ethical challenges. Scientists who want to examine how interfering with an animal's nature, natural instincts impacts their safety would have to design randomized experiments that would endanger large population of animal, large populations of animals. They'd have to change an animal pack's natural inclination to feed and breed their powerful and aggressive members against their will. They would have to force them to breed in ways they wouldn't naturally choose to breed and place them in hazardous environments surrounded by predators and then measure how well they survive. Scientists would have to repeat these experiments enough times with enough animal species across multiple environments and time periods to create a sufficiently randomized set from which they can casually, causally infer that change in an animal pack's pecking order so that they're less physically powerful and aggressive does indeed cause them to be less secure against predators, thus less likely to survive. Scientific rigor would make it necessary to send large population of animal species to their demise to generate enough data to causally infer this sort of relationship. I'm sorry. Wow. In these types of situations where experimentation is not feasible due to practical or ethical concerns, scientists can take an alternative approach. They can look for serendipitous source of random variation in existing data sets. There are ways to analyze data ex post facto that statistically mimic randomized experimentation well enough to infer causal relationships between different variables with sufficient confidence, e.g. propensity score matching, instrumental variable analysis. All one needs to do is find the right data set on which to perform this type of analysis. In other words, a scientist who wants to look for a causally inferable relationship between variables like systemic security and physical aggression wouldn't have to design unethical experiments which endanger animals. They could search for sufficiently randomized data sets which already exist and study those instead. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you think about it, there is already a plethora of serendipitous sources of randomized experimentation on large populations of animals across many different regions and timeframes from which it's possible to causally infer a relationship between an animal population's capacity and inclination to be physically aggressive and their capacity to survive. Humans have already adopted the habit of interfering with the pecking order of pack animals to prevent them from feeding and breeding their most physically powerful and aggressive members, and then placing them in hazardous environments where they are highly vulnerable to predation. Humans have been slaughtering dozens of different type of animal species across diverse environments for more than 10,000 years. We slaughter and devour billions of these animals. We exper these experiments have become so ubiquitous and routine that many people don't even notice them anymore. From these experiments, sapiens have already created a data set from which it's trivial to causally infer a relationship between security and lack of physical aggression. Over the course of tens of thousands of years, we have created many A-B tests and experiments which demonstrate quite clearly what happens to the safety, security, and survival of animals when they become less inclined to impose severe physical costs on their neighbors. Chapter 3.10.5 an honest description of the systemic and socio-technical implications of domestication. The difference between a Siberian wolf and a dash hound is the difference between pecking order heuristics. Different feeding and breeding heuristics result in clear differences between each animal's capacity and inclination to project physical power and impose severe physical costs on neighbors. One pecking order strategy produces something optimized for independence and survival in the wild, the wolf. The other produces something optimized to serve its master, the dog. This example alone sums up one, why pecking order matters, and two, why it's existentially imperative for the freedom and prosperity of animals 
not to stop feeding and breeding the strongest, most intelligent, and most aggressive members of their pack. Considering how the word wiener is slang for weak and ineffectual, the term wiener dog is highly appropriate. Dogs, dash hounds especially, are weak and ineffectual wolves. As sapiens have shown multiple times across thousands of years of randomized experimentation in multiple different environments with at least 40 different species of animals of multiple different classes, mammals, birds, and even fishes, slight adjustments to the way animal packs feeds and feed and breed the strongest and most physically aggressive members of the pack lead to substantial differences in their ability to keep themselves secure against predators. The domestication of animals offers a large data set which conclu with conclusive evidence to show that there is a direct cause causally inferable relationship between an animal's capacity and inclination to be physically aggressive and their capacity to survive, prosper, and live freely. The less an animal is inclined to impose severe physical costs on their neighbors, the easier they are to be syst systemically exploited and led straight to slaughter. Changing peck and order heuristics is something other than feed and breed the most po physically powerful and aggressive members of the pack has had an incontrovertible impact for the safety, security, and survival of dozens of animal species. This implies that peck and order strategies how animals instinctively choose to establish control authority over their resources fundamentally represents a power projection tactic which directly affects their capacity for survival. The survivor's dilemma, i.e. the strategic imperative to increase CA, therefore applies to peck and order heuristics just the same as it applies to other power projection tactics. The better peck and order heuristics are, the, the better Pecking heuristics are the ones which maximize an animal pack's ability to decrease BCRA by imposing severe physically prohibitive costs on attackers. In other words, animal packs don't reward their most powerful and aggressive members with feeding and breeding rights because it's the right thing to do. They do it because all the animals that didn't do it didn't survive. Establishing the right peck and order strategy represents an existential imperative for pack animals. There is no less, it is no less vital for the survival of a pack of hyenas to establish an advantageous peck and order over a fresh kill than it is for a starving family of humans to ration their bread. Choosing who to feed and breed first is one of the most critical decisions a pack of animals can make. And there is a lot to be learned from observing how nature's top surviving animal packs make this decision. Ironically, the animals we most commonly observe in nature today are not wild animals. So not only do we get a false representation of nature on our TV screens, but we also get a false representation of nature during our most common interactions with animals. This further distorts people's perception of how ugly the business of survivorship really is. We can recalibrate our distorted perception of reality by identifying the source of the distortions and filtering them out. To better understand the merits of different pecking order strategies, the distortions of reality we need to filter out are the animals we routinely slaughter. Sapiens have shown it's possible to change a wild animal pack's pecking order heuristics by genetically entrapping and enslaving them. If you entrap a herd of Arokes and then feed and breed the muscular and docile ones, you get a herd of oxen. If you entrap a herd of Arokes and then feed and breed the obese and docile ones, you get a herd of cows. If you entrap a litter of boar and then feed and breed the obese and docile ones, you get a litter of pigs. If you entrap a, f a flock of jungle fowl, and then feed and breed the obese and docile ones, you get a flock of chickens. These activities produce A-B testing experiments where oxen, cows, pigs, and chickens become the treatment and the arox, boar, and jungle fowl become the control. To measure how removing the physically powerful and aggressive members of an animal pack affects their ability to survive against predators, simply take inventory of the difference between the bacon on your plate and the boars you aren't eating.
from that data, it's possible to infer a causal relationship between docility and survival. Across a wide range of randomized variables, the docile animals are the ones we keep in cage to eat or to do our manual labor. Time and time again, from multiple different species, in multiple different experiments with high variability, we have proven that one, a pack's capacity for survival and propensity depends upon their pack and order strategy. And two, the best way to degrade a pack's safety, security, freedom, and independence is to prevent or undermine their capacity and inclination to impose physical costs on their oppressors by preventing them from feeding and breeding their most physically powerful and aggressive members. Chapter 3.10.6 To make it to the top of the dominance hierarchy, domesticate your peers. Natural selection caused many pack animals to become sexually dimorphic where one gender is, the genetically opti is genetically optimized to be physically stronger and more physically aggressive than the other. For some species, the female is genetically optimized to be more physically powerful and aggressive. For others, it's the male. Either way, with few exceptions, natural instincts make animals sexually attracted to physically powerful, intelligent, and assertive members of the pack. These instincts ensure the species genetically self-optimizes itself for survival, by passing on the genes of the most physically powerful, intelligent, and assertive members. In the mammalian class, males often have higher testosterone levels contributing to sexual dimorphism and making them physically stronger and more aggressive members of the pack. This sexual dimorphism is a design feature that sapiens learn how to exploit learned how to exploit. To change the feed and breed the powerful first, peck and order heuristic employed by mammalian pack animals, sapiens learned how to neuter the strongest and most physically aggressive males to remove their genes from the gene pool. This tactic is given polite sounding names like selective breeding, but what it represents from a socio-technical and honest perspective is a way to force an entire species to become less physically powerful and aggressive through genetic modifications, thus less capable of and inclined to impose severe physical costs on their human oppressors. Domestication is therefore a form of predation, a power projection tactic that dramatically reshaped our world and put sapiens at the top of a global inter interspecies dominance hierarchy. Wild mammals have had their peck and order strategy exploited via domestication are called livestock. Wild birds, which have had their peck and order strategy exploited via domestication, are called poultry. Today, the biomass of domesticated livestock is comprised mostly of cattle and pigs and is about four times higher than the biomass of the rest of the world's non-domesticated wild mammals combined. The biomass of domesticated poultry is about three times higher than the biomass of the rest of the world's wild birds combined. It's harder to domesticate birds because they can fly away, hence why most poultry are flightless or nearly flightless birds. Reference 67. A domesticated animal is a wild animal that has had its CA unnaturally shrunken. As illustrated in bowtie notation in figure 25, this type of exploitation is possible because many pack animals employ a specialized workforce devoted to the task of being physically powerful and aggressive. By simply identifying that workforce and not allowing them to multiply, it's possible to dramatically reduce an animal pack's overall CA over time, thus raising their BCRA, shrinking their prosperity margin, and making them easier to devour. Here we have figure 25, how domestication works. The primary value delivered function of domestication is to make it easier for humans to exploit and devour enslaved animals. The process is centered around reducing an animal's ability and inclination to project power and impose severe physical costs, i.e. raise CA and lower BCRA. By simply not allowing these animals to instinctively feed and breed and multiply their strongest and most aggressive power projectors, it becomes much easier to oppress them. With their, physical, 
With their physical aggression intentionally bred out of them, oxen will allow themselves to become pack animals, routinely whipped and forced into drawing heavy loads for their masters, namely plows. These plows are used to dredge up nutrients from the soil to aid in a process called irrigation. Irrigation helps produce more food for other animals, which have also been systemically entrapped and forcefully enslaved by sapiens, creating a positive reinforce and feedback loop of plant and animal exploitation called agriculture. An overwhelming majority of all domesticated animals are herbivores for this reason. It's easier to feed herbivores using the fruit of their own slave labor. The oxen is whipped to irrigate land to grow grain to feed more oxen and their other domesticated friends. The genetic entrapment and enslavement of animals via domestication is the practice upon which civilized human society was built in the Neolithic age. This is one of many reasons why modern sapiens should think twice before condemning the physically aggressive behavior of a lion or any other wild animal species that have successfully avoided being domesticated by humans. We have a large enough data set to causally infer that it's precisely because these animals are physically aggressive that they have not yet been domesticated. Chapter 3.10.7 The dominant species on any given planet is the species with pets. A dog is a wolf which has had its pecking order exploited over the course of 40,000 years to remove its capacity and inclination to impose severe physical costs on humans. Take a pack of wolves, neuter the mean and aggressive ones, breed the docile and subservient and physically deformed ones, and the end state of that process is a shorter, stubbier, and more codependent creature which exists to serve its master. The reason why dogs are man's best friend is because they were genetically modified to worship humans by exploiting their pecking order. Meaner and less obedient dogs, i.e. more wolf-like dogs, aren't fed and bred. Nicer and more obedient dogs, which literally lick their master's feet, are called good dogs. Domestication is perhaps the most vivid display of interspecies domination possible. If we were to discover a planet with alien life, we would easily be able to identify the dominant species of that planet by finding the one which entrapped and turned 40 other species into their pets, slaves, and food supply. Domestication represents the ability to remove another species' physical power altogether rather than fight them. The ability to change a survivor of the wild into food to eat, or a tool to use, or a pet to cuddle. This is an honest and undistorted picture of human predation, that ugly part of survivorship that humans don't like to be reminded about. What is the point of this uncomfortable conversation? To prove a point. We have conclusive, causally inferable, empirical evidence to indicate with a high degree of confidence that substantial impairments to safety, security, and survival are the direct result of not being physically powerful and aggressive. Domestication has created a data set of highly randomized A-B testing experiments across more than three dozen species of animals of multiple classes in multiple environments over tens of thousands of years. It's incontrovertibly true that changing an animal's pecking order strategy to prevent them from giving their resources to their most physically powerful and aggressive members has a direct causal impact on their security. When populations become less capable of or inclined to impose severe physical costs on their attackers or oppressors, they become less safe, less secure, and less free. Chapter 3.10.8 If domesticating wild animals is predatory behavior, then so is domesticating humans. The domestication of animals has proven to be a very effective power projection tactic. In other words, domestication is highly effective is a highly effective form of predation. 
This is important for the reader to understand because if domestication represents a systemic security risk to the freedom and prosperity of 40 different animal species, then domestication has the potential to threaten sapiens too. Not only is there a systemic danger of self-domestication, but domestication itself is a form of attack against human society. Remove society's capacity and inclination to impose severe physical costs on other humans, and that will have a direct and measurable effect on their ability to survive and prosper. Human societies, therefore, have a fiduciary responsibility to not allow themselves to become too self-domesticated. Societies who are interested in survival and prosperity should not allow themselves to become less capable of and inclined to be physically aggressive to potential attackers or oppressors. Honest descriptions of domestication are useful because they demonstrate how poorly designed resource control systems rep how poorly designed resource control systems represent a strategic security hazard. Our capacity to prosper depends on the heuristics we adopt to settle our disputes, control our resources, and determine the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of our property. Animals are demonstrably susceptible to entrapment and enslavement if they don't adopt resource control strategies, i.e. pecking orders, which minimize their BCRA. It has been proven time and time again that if packs don't utilize the optimal peck and order strategy, they become vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. The domestication of animals represents multiple repeatable randomized experiments where peck and order was the isolated variable. Not rewarding physically powerful and aggressive members of the pack with higher levels of control authority over the pack's valuable resources didn't produce higher level of prosperity for these species. It produced the meat we put it on our sandwiches. There's no sort shortage of empirical data to indicate that once a population stops feeding and breeding their physically powerful project their physical power projectors, they start plowing fields worshiping their masters, and lining up for slaughter. Is that what you want to do? This has significant implications for sapiens who condemn the use of physical power and physical aggression to establish peck and order over resources because of the energy it uses or the injury it causes. This is further explored in the next chapter. Physical power and aggression clearly have a substantial effect on a population's safety, security, survival, and prosperity. Domesticated animals prove a causal link between docility and enslavement. Therefore, we should be cautious of people who encourage docility and condemn physical power as the basis for settling disputes, establishing control authority over resources, or achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership or chain of custody of property. It's clearly a security hazard and can also be a deliberate attack vector. This is a critical concept for the reader to understand for discussions in the following two chapters about power projecting tactics in both society and cyberspace. This concept is also critical for understanding the socio-technical implications of Bitcoin. Chapter 3.10.9, Check Your Power Projection Privilege. Studying dogs is more anthropo anthropology than zoology. If you want to know how far we've moved from the place we were designed to inhabit, look at modern dogs. The tragic wheezing ones with bows in their forelocks and squished faces and bent legs. Squashed faces and bent legs. Not proper dogs the ones with faces like wolves. Charles Foster, reference 68. As discussed in the previous section, how a population of animals chooses to divvy up its resources can significantly impact its ability to survive and prosper. If a pack doesn't put the strongest, fastest, leanest, meanest, and most intelligent members of the pack at the top of its pecking order, like it has been instinctively programmed by natural selection to do, it will likely experience different complex emergent behavior related to safety, security, survival, and prosperity. 
To repeat, this is not military dogma speaking. This is backed by an overwhelmingly large data set created by thousands of years of randomized experiments on animal, animal population from which causal inference is possible. The reader probably ate a piece of that data set today. You gotta accept it. If animal populations could survive by employing first come first serve or finders keepers or other resource control protocols, then we could observe them in the wild forming neat and orderly lines to access their food and territory. If wild animal packs could survive using alternative heuristics like divide food evenly, then we observe this behavior in the wild. If animal packs could survive by letting their youngest, oldest, sickest, and most injured members have priority over resources, we would likely observe this behavior in the wild. But we don't observe these behaviors in the wild. In fact, we routinely observe the exact opposite behavior. Parents eat their babies or throw them out of the nest for being weak and ineffectual. Lions kill their cubs. With very few exceptions, wild pack animals abandon their sick, elderly, and injured. The physically powerful and aggressive members of the pack are rewarded with maiden rights and control authority over resources. And physical power is used as the basis for achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of resources. The overwhelming majority of animals adopt physical power-based resource control hierarchies where they settle property disputes using physical power. Somehow, different evolutionary paths all converge on practically the same physical power-based resource control and dominance hierarchies. In these systems, power projectors don't wait in line for food or breeding rights. They automatically get first dibs. Instead of being angry at their physical power projectors for these offenses, Many pack animals, including sapiens, are sexually attracted to their power projectors. They instinctively want their most physically fit and powerful to have first dibs on food and maiden rights to ensure their genes remain in the population's gene pool. Completely different species separated by major land masses all independently converged on the same physical power-based resource control protocols, despite dozens of other perfectly viable options for settling disputes, establishing control authority over resources, and achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their property. These animals didn't compare notes, but they converge on practically the same might is right pecking order heuristic. Why did this happen? A knee jerk reaction to this question is to be condescending towards pack animals and label their behavior as savage, as if humans aren't cut from the exact same cloth. As if the foundation of Neolithic sapient civilization wasn't based on our mastery of this exact same power projection tactic over animals. We hunted competing animal populations to extinction and then entrapped, enslaved, and devoured the survivors to form what we called civilized society. Civilization is often considered to be a prerogative term to those who study nature. Nature. Sapiens are also instinctively attracted to signs of physical strength, and they constantly celebrate their capacity to project physical power against each other. Humans have no intellectually honest ground on which to stand and accuse animals of being savage, or act like might is right peck in order heuristics are beneath them. Sapiens use the same physical power-based resource control protocols, whether they like to admit it or not. This is a core concept of the next chapter. Another common reaction to the question of why pack animals overwhelmingly favor, feed, and breed the powerful first, aka might is right peck and order heuristics, is to discredit their intelligence and label this behavior as unsophisticated. An argument is often raised that pack animals simply don't have the mental capacity to employ other, more sophisticated resource control heuristics that are less destructive or harmful. This argument presumes that alternative heuristics that aren't as prone to injury like first come, first serve 
or feed and breed the weakest first, are somehow more cognitively complex than feed and breed the strongest first. This presumption has no rational grounds because it's arguably more difficult to establish and maintain pecking order hierarchies based on power projection capacity. Physical power-based resource control protocols like feed and breed the most physically powerful first, or might is right, require members of the pack to spend a great deal of time and effort constantly asserting themselves and finding opportunities to both improve and display their capacity and inclination to project power. Watching a pack of wild animals establish peck in order is usually an exercise in watching them constantly battle each other. Pack animals, e.g. birds and mammals, commonly snap at each other to assert physical dominance to keep a running tally of who deserves to be fed and bred first and what their position is within the dominance hierarchy. This is an energy-intensive chore which appears to take up more time and energy than alternative peck in order heuristics like first come first serve or feed the youngest first or feed the oldest first. It's also clearly more dangerous and prone to causing physical injury, creating a distinct a distinctive to adopt it, a, creating a disincentive to adopt it. There are simply too many downsides to the might is right pecking order heuristic to claim that it's unsophisticated. There must be a reason why this pecking order strategy overcame the, the disincentive to use it and become the dominant strategy in nature. A third reaction to the question of why pack animals use feed and breed the powerful first to establish control authority over their resources is to argue that weaker members simply don't have the option to do anything but allow physically powerful members to continuously eat first due to being physically overpowered. This simply isn't valid. Mutiny is clearly an option. Power projectors like Mufasa may be strong, but they also need sleep. There's plenty of opportunity over the course of living together for disenfranchised members of the pack to cut the throat of abusive pack members to stop them from habitually cutting the line and allowing other pack members to starve. So why don't pack members team up and kill their alpha power projectors in those moments when they're vulnerable? Why do pack members allow themselves and their offspring to starve to death in service to the strongest members of their pack? Weaker members of the pack certainly have the mental capacity to cooperate together and overthrow abusive members, else they wouldn't have the cognitive ability to cooperate and live together as a pack in the first place. The subject of peck and order and resource control is where it becomes important for sapiens to check themselves on their survivorship bias and their privilege as the, as the world's apex predator. We need to remind ourselves that the only that only the best strategies for safety, security, and survival can survive four billion years of entropic chaos. Modern sapiens judge and criticize the behavior of wild animals from behind a safety moat filled with the blood of competitors they drove to extinction. Humans burned and speared and slaughtered their way to the comfort of the armchairs from which they pontificate about right and wrong or fair and unfair ways to settle disputes, establish control authority over resources, and determine the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property. There is currently not a surviving mammal on this planet more predatory and destructive than humans. Chapter 3.10.10 Pack animals need their power projectors to survive. Now that we have explored these core concepts of power projection, let's return to the example of Mufasa. Mufasa killed the pride's cubs because resources are scarce and because the world is a cruel and unforgiving place full of predators and entropy. The pride must remain physically powerful and aggressive if they are to survive in this congested, contested, competitive, and hostile environment. Their pr prosperity depends on being able to maximize their CA as much as they can, lest they risk extinction or perhaps worse, domestication. The pride will not allow themselves to muddy their gene pool or waste their precious time, energy, and food resources, raising the offspring of demonstrably weaker and ineffectual lions. So Mufasa followed his natural instincts, instincts developed over millions of years of natural selections, a selection, and killed the cubs. 
If you hear that snoring, that is a domesticated smush face wolf. The mother of the slain cubs can will not retaliate against Mufasa because they instinctively understand how vitally important Mufasa's physical power and aggression are for their pack's mutual survival. Physical power and aggression are virtues for safety, security, and survival in the wild. The pack needs Mufasa's physical power and aggression to survive as much as they need oxygen. They need to keep Mufasa fed, and they need to breed with him to add his genetics to the gene pool. Why? Because of primordial, primordial economics and the survivor's dilemma. The pride needs to manage resources effectively while lowering the pride's BCRA as much as possible. And they can accomplish both by killing the offspring of demonstrably weaker parents. It sounds cruel, but what works is what survives. And we have very compelling evidence to indicate this strategy is effective because most of us have no idea what a lion tastes like. In conclusion, the behavior we see in nature should be regarded with solemn respect, not condescension or sanctimony. Nature offers a free lesson in survival from something that has been around far longer than we have, and it's good to listen to the hard-won wisdom of our elders, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us feel. By virtue of its ubiquity, Nature's chosen peck and order strategy of feed and breed the power projectors first, aka might is right, deserves our reverence because it has been regression tested over thousand, thousands of millennia. Physical power based dominance hierarchies are demonstrably more secure against predation, exploitation, enslavement, and abuse capable of passing a very unforgiven natural selection process. This means we should take physical power-based resource control protocols seriously and have some intellectual humility before we condemn them. There's a reason why they survive, and we should seek to understand that reason from a systemic and socio-technical perspective. Moreover, we should recognize that humans are clearly not above these sorts of physical power projection strategies. If anything, humans are the undisputed masters of them.